Okay, uh, Dr. Walter Crinion uh, is a naturopathic physician who is well known throughout the country for his work in detox, well, toxicology, toxins, toxicants, and and Dr. Bauerschmidt has been trying to train me to say the word depuration. Is that right? Yeah, you got depuration right. Depuration. And toxicants. And toxicants. Yeah, well, yeah. Dr. Mike's been working with me, and I'm kind of a slow learner, actually. So uh, anyway, uh, we're very pleased to have Walter here today to tell us about environmental toxicants and complete cancer care. And I do have to say this, after uh, Tim Guilford's uh, lecture, he came to me and says, I'm totally redoing my lecture, so just throw out your notes because I don't know how totally different it is. Is it totally different? Yes. Totally different, so you'll actually have two presentations. One you'll have to read on your own, but this is hot off the press, Dr. Walter Crinion. Thank you. Walter. Thank you, Ryan. Well, good afternoon. Uh, it's a little bit of a homecoming for me because I started my career in naturopathic medicine 36 years ago, right down the road here, when uh, the National College of Naturopathic Medicine was teaching the first two years of training at Kansas Newman. Wow. Right down the road here. So, uh, so it's like um, when I packed my wife and my daughter up in my 1968 International Harvester pickup truck in the summer of 19, 1980 to drive up to Seattle to uh, uh, jump in with the first class at Bastyr University. That's when I said sayonara to Wichita, and now I'm back, literally in the shadow of, of Kansas Newman. Saw it when I went by um, from the airport. So. That was my old topic, title, and now this is my new one. Cancer's common environmental toxicants and their interplay with all that Tim said. <laughs> so uh, let me just start out that uh, World Health Organization, as of uh, a little, almost a year ago, October 17th of 2013, has now rated air pollution as a category one carcinogen. Air pollution. Now, how many of you are exposed to air pollution on a daily basis? Okay, one of the other effects of air pollution is cognitive disorder. Uh, for those of you who did not raise your hand. Um, so, I mean, um, the amount of literature that's been coming out in the last few years about the health, adverse health effects of air, air pollution is mind-boggling. And it, the weight is so incredible of the information on that and the fact that we aren't doing anything about it is even more monumentally insane, um, the adverse effects of air pollution. So it's now an IIRC category one carcinogen. And for the most part, most of the cancers now that are associated with uh, in, uh, outdoor air pollution, which, and, and we tend to think outdoor air pollution is outside, right? Because we call it outdoor. But where'd the air in this room come from? Where'd the air in your house come from? It all came from outside, and then you add to it all the CRAP inside, so the in, indoor air is that is the same toxicant base as outside plus whatever you have decided to add to it. So the big cancers that have really been associated, lung, head, neck, nasal pharyngeal, breast, and bladder cancers are the big ones. And there was just an article just published in the Chinese Journal of Cancer, I mean, just like this past one or two weeks, uh, looking at the cancers of lung, head, and neck on the rise um, in China. As you know, the air pollution in China is horrific. Uh, and it doesn't stay there, it comes over here. And the cancer rates have been going up. And look at the difference between urban and rural areas. 
hmm, I wonder why that could be. Well, probably a lot of reasons, but air pollution is, is the number one, and these are all clearly associated in uh, China with air pollution, nasal pharyngeal, which we'll come back to, remember that name, oral, laryngeal, and pharyngeal. Um, this article also was just published by Susan Phillips. She's done some great ones. And um, parental occupation to engine exhaust and childhood brain tumor. So not just cancer on the person who's breathing it, a cancer on the, the child living inside the person that's breathing it. We've also got another one also by Susan Peters on childhood brain tumors associated with parental occupational exposure to solvents. So not just for the person that's breathing it, but generational as well. And as you are undoubtedly aware, the rate of childhood brain cancers has been going up dramatically in the last couple of decades, along with the rates of autism, uh, along with the rates of ADHD, along with chemical sensitivity, fibromyalgia, um, Parkinsonism, all uh, type 2 diabetes, all these things that are strongly associated with environmental uh, toxicant overload. The common mechanism of all those in those studies is DNA damage from particulate matter and PAHs. DNA oxidative damage, which brings me to, my, you know, one of my favorite things when I was a kid was doing connect the dots. I don't know if you guys like that, but I love connect the dots when I was a kid. I really did. So I'm going to try to connect the dots. That's Tim and I, by the way. <laughs> I'm going to try to connect the dots from Dr. Guilford's talk with genetics, oxidative stress, pro-inflammatory states, and mitochondrial dysfunction. Um, because when I was listening to him, I would just you know, this is all the environmental issues that I kept hearing. And um, let me start with genetics. So gen the idea of genetics, uh, predisposition, as well as uh, uh, polymorphisms in, in biotransformation. So does genetic predisposition mean you have to say ta-ta to the ta-tas? Uh, obviously, she thought that, and a lot of people do. You know, they do, they've done the 23 and me, and they go, oh my God, I'm genetically predisposed for this. You know, let me, let me go shoot myself now if it's Alzheimer's, or let me cut off my breast if I, you know, got breast cancer risk. Um, but the catchphrase for the last couple decades has been, yes, genetics points the gun, but it's the environment that pulls the trigger. As you all know, there are all these genetic markers associated with, with certain diseases, but not everybody with those genetic markers gets the disease. Why? Genetics points the gun and only points the gun. It doesn't do both. So this is a recent article, and I got the PMID number up there. So you know, if you go to uh, PubMed, all you gotta do is put the number in the search box and the whole article comes up. Those of you like myself who've been around this field of medicine for a long time, uh, you know, like you go see Jeff Bland talk and he, you know, like <laughs> Smith XY, and, you know, in Annals of New York Medicine or something, and, and the date. Did you ever try to find that? <laughs> it's like totally impossible. So just put the PMID numbers. I was so pleased that Tim was doing the same thing. So anyhow, this article here, Mediterranean diet reduces the adverse effect of that polymorphism on cardiovascular risk, risk factors and strokes. You got genetics, but if you got the right diet and lifestyle, you don't get the problem. I come from a long line of heart disease. Long line. In my father's tree, everybody's had heart disease. His, his brothers, his sisters, they've all died of it. My dad had his his first heart attack at age 48. Um, I recently went through a cardiovascular uh, assessment. They had the treadmill cranked up, greatest degree it could go, and they got tired of running it. 
And they said, you know, you got the, you got the, the cardiovascular system of a 26-year-old, which for a man my age is, <laughs> it rocks. <laughs> you know? So I, have, I got the genetics, but I don't have the dis disease. I mean, I knew that was in my family when I entered naturopathic medical school, and I've been doing diet and lifestyle and supplementation to avoid that, you know, since I've been in medical school, and it works. You know, we, we know those things are lifestyle-related diseases. So why don't people change their lifestyle? It's, I don't get it. Do you guys get it? I don't get it. I just don't get it. You know? So, you know, <laughs> who here wants to have cancer? Who here wants to have heart disease? Well, I got a clue. Those are the two leading causes of deaths in this country. And I see some individuals who may have been born in another country. Joke's on you. You moved here. Now you got the same thing. <laughs> you know, so it's their lifestyle-related disorders. What are you going to do? Keep doing the same standard lifestyle and go, oh, my, why did that happen? No. You know, even if you got the lifestyle, if you got the lifestyle of genetics, baby, it's a slam dunk. Absolutely slam dunk. But we don't have to go there. Normal aging is not normal. So here are some of the slides that Tim had. I just did a screenshot so you see some of Tim's slides right up here that I'm trying to link in with. So he talked about the genetic polymorphisms of things making glutathione. And these two, you know, 24% of controls and 17% of controls, you know, we get, we get people coming to us who are ill. And uh, for years, I did uh, the uh, Genova Diagnostics, uh, you know, SNP panel for the the, tox the, the to toxicogenomics, you know, the phase one and phase two. And um, another naturopathic doc in, in Scottsdale who specializes in cancer treatment, Dan Rubin, has been running in all his patients. Well, the average percentage for... Uh, the glutathione transferase polymorphisms is about 50% of the population. Now, I do a, a, about a six-month physician's training in environmental medicine that I've been doing for 12 years or so. There's some docs in here who have taken it. And uh, we used to do, oh, yes, remember Tom? Uh, we used to do, uh, Tom was there. And he said, well, I can do biopsies on people. So that year, we actually did fat biopsies as well as blood levels of, of toxicants on people. And then we started doing the, uh, the uh, biotransformation um, tests. And you know, the, the healthy physicians, instead of having the glutathione transferase at 50% of the population, had it at 25% of the population. And one of those years, uh, one of the, the docs who was uh, taking the class called up the lab and said, hey, I got this deal through Crinian's class, and can I send patients' labs in and get the same deal? It was 50% off at Genova, which was you know, really good. And uh, I, I, I don't know what, why Genova said it, because I, I worked forever to get that deal. It took me years, and then she just calls up and I go, sure. So all of a sudden, I got all these reports back the next year from all these people I didn't know. And I did all the tallies, and I went, whoa, we got like 63% of the people this year had the glutathione transferase polymorphism. What's the deal? It was because of all the patients. And that's what Dan Rubin has found, that he does, in his cancer patients, he doesn't find it 50% of the time. He finds it like 70, 75, 80% of the time. And the, and the more polymorphins, polymorphisms they have, the more ill they are. So while you're finding that, oh, let me go back to the glutathione, the one, the stuff to make glutathione, GCLC, 17% of the of the controls, and glutathione peroxidase polymorphism in 24%. If you get to ill people, that's much higher. So guess what percentage of if we took chemically sensitive patients who are all low in glutathione? So just if you got one who's got who can't walk down the soap aisle, who gets a uh, headache from sitting in somewhere with perfume, who gets headache from a diesel truck, any of those. They don't have to be, you know, like paralyzed in life from it, but anybody that's got a, a chemical sensitivity is low glutathione. 
Anybody's got asthma in their history, low glutathione. Guess what happened to all those people that were trying to do the rescue work at World Trade Center, now they got the chronic respiratory problems? Low glutathione, you know? So you're gonna find this in a much higher percentage of your patients than what's being shown here. So there's the glutathione transferase P1 that Tim showed about um, both xenobiotic metabolism problems and susceptibility to cancer and other diseases, and then more uh, problems with lower glutathione. So, you know, over the years, there's been great debate in the scientific literature about do environmental toxins cause cancer? And it really depends on who you read and who they were funded by. Um, but when you look at the body of research about these enzymes that are supposed to help clear toxicants out of the body, it's clear. If you have a changes in your body that prevents you from adequately clearing toxins out of the body, you have higher rates of cancer, period, end of story. No one disputes this. No one disputes this. So here with glutathione transferation, uh, glutathione transferase M1, you have higher rates of bladder cancer, stomach cancer, colon cancer, esophageal cancer, prostate cancer, acute childhood lymphoblastic leukemia, postmenopausal breast cancer, um, prostate cancer, childhood ALL, lung and brain, multiple myeloma, as well as my myelodysplasia and leukopenia. So um, testicular, oral, pharyngeal, and bladder cancers. So if you don't metabolize these things right, you got higher risk of cancer because these compounds stay in your body for a longer period of time they can cause more illness. Now, um, back to the Angelina Jolie thing. So you got those genetic polymorphisms. So again, genetics points the gun. Environment pulls the trigger. If you're not exposed to a lot of those toxicants, will you have the problem? No! Okay, well, how do I stop breathing air? <laughs> Okay, I want you to all avoid outdoor air pollution. Let's all take a deep breath and hold it. Um, well, there's fortunately uh, brassicas to the rescue. Even people with the null genotypes, if they do uh, for glutathione transferase, if they do a lot of a brassica, wow. So here's current smokers who do not eat brassicas. Their odds ratio if they have the glutathione transferase SNPs, their odds ratio for lung cancer is 2.22. It's over twice the rate. You want a W rate of lung cancer for your risk? <laughs> Just, I mean, and that's in 50% of the population, right? Now, those with the glutathione transferase uh, T1 null and who do not eat brassicas, they have an even higher odds ratio. 3.19. Those eating brassicas reduce their odds ratio to basically just 9% more than a non-smoker. Just eating brassica. Whoa! Now, you can also get benefit uh, with uh, vitamin E and C for some. Now, this is not cancer, but it does show a beneficial effect. Uh, there are a number of other things, uh, articles that show beneficial effect for N-acetylcysteine. So increasing glutathione, increasing glutathione transferase. Now, do you guys know, can, can you think of any other uh, excellent, uh, commonly used uh, botanical, typically on a daily basis? Some of you might have consumed it. To <laughs> Ron, you're too good. <laughs> So botanical that enhances glutathione transferase functions, enhances glutathione peroxidase function, enhances glutathione production, and is listed in the scientific literature as the finest chemotherapeutic agent known to man. Ron. Green tea. Green tea. <laughs> which also, also enhances the excretion out of your bowels into the toilet of persistent organic pollutants, DDT, PCBs, polybrominated diphenyl ethers, all that stuff you're getting from your farm 
Atlantic salmon dysfunctional food meal <laughs> that that you had for lunch. <laughs> really? Yeah. Well, I guess I was good. It was a good thing I was sitting up in my in my room up there, frantically putting these slides together. Um, yeah, I just did a uh, what I told you I do this uh, six month physician training in environmental medicine, and we just had one of our weekends in Phoenix last weekend, and and I was going over the the lady the first day she she brings in like, you know, a plate of Danish and muffins, and I went, you can take the Danish out of here. Maybe someone will have a muffin. She says, oh, okay, well, let, let me go bring the bagels. I said, no bagels. We, there's like, I don't think there's anybody in here that eat, eats wheat or gluten. I don't think there is. Oh, okay. Um, and so then she said, well, let me show you the lunch menu. And it was, it was salmon. I go, no, no way. Yeah. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, Ron. I'm, It is what it is, yeah. So you won't hear me say that the PCBs you just consume have a half-life of 15 years, which for some of you, you'll never get rid of them. But if you do green tea, you double your excretion of those things out of your body. Double it. So two venti zen cups of green tea a day, and you can dramatically reduce your persistent pollutant load. Green tea, and it's, again, I've been blown away by the literature. I have these safe searches on PubMed, which you can do. It's great. When you do a good search on PubMed, you can save it, and then you'll get in your email the first Saturday of every month or whatever all the updates from that search that you did. So one of mine is on green tea. There's at least 20 articles I get every month on it, and the, science, the researchers are, have called it the finest chemotherapeutic agent known to man. So... Pardon? No, they don't say that. <laughs> Certainly they don't say that in the um, articles on green tea. So uh, Tim talked a lot about oxidative damage, and it's very, uh, with um, cancer as a, uh, as, as a genesis of the cancer, and my understanding is that the oxidative damage to the DNA is what brings about the um, the development of cancer and the more uh, oxidative damage to the DNA, the worse the cancer. That it, is someone going to tell me that that's now wrong? I mean, I'm open, but that's it would really screw up the rest of my talk if you did. So, Tim, you're going to say that that's right or, or that I'm wrong. Yeah, so what, you, what I see in the literature is things called DNA addicts, um, which is uh, oxidative damage to the DNA. You get enough of those, you get, you get wacky DNA. So here's again from Tim, um, decades-long latent stage of breast cancer, uh, prior to histological changes related to chronic oxidative stress in the breast tissue. Again, from Dr. Gillifords, uh, prevalence of oxidative stress gives rise to inflammation and that's associated with low glutathione. And uh, it is evident that oxidative stress is the generator of inflammatory conditions in breast cancer. Hence, there is need to establish the robust biomarkers for diagnosis and prognosis of the disease. Oxidative stress is um, one of the base roots of cancer, but it's one of the base roots of all chronic illnesses. Again, all these lifestyle-related illness. Now, there were two articles that Natalia Brucker did out of uh, Brazil. Brilliant. These are two of the best laid-out research articles I've ever read. I mean, I was just totally blown away. Now, in addition to doing the, the annual or the, the physician's training in environmental medicine, I have a monthly uh, subscription podcast called Crinian Opinion. I like that name. And I review uh, uh, environmental medicine articles every month, and then you, you get this MP4, and and um, and so this this came right out of, the, of this past month's cranian opinion. So I just reviewed it, and then 
Tim's talking and I'm just getting all these connections blowing up in my brain. So if there's smoke coming out of the ears, blame Tim. So what uh, Natalia Brucker did is they looked to um, markers for um, uh, air, air pollution and uh, so they, they tested air pollution levels, looked at the metabolites of certain air pollutants in people. There were taxi drivers in Brazil and non-taxi drivers in Brazil. And then um, okay. So um, ooh, yeah, maybe I should mention that. No, no, no. So what they looked at was, um, so the laboratory measurements they did was they, they, you know, every city has monitors that measure like the particulate matter and the benzoapyrene. Benzoapyrene is an aromatic hydrocarbon that comes out of your tailpipes and that's the, the carcinogenic thing in cigarettes and it's a carcinogenic thing in, in tailpipes and volcanoes and flame broiled whoppers and everything like that. The metabolite in the urine for the benzoapyrene is 1-hydroxypyrene, one 1-OHP. One so in this study they got, they had the levels, you know, that the air monitors had for, you know, Brazil, uh, this town in Brazil at that time. Uh, so they knew what they were exposed to, but let, they also checked to see, well, what was the metabolite level in everybody? to document that yes, indeed, they weren't driving around with a clothespin on their nose or wearing uh, you know, some kind of a gas mask, okay? And then they measured oxidative markers, both for lipid peroxidation and protein damage. They looked at the inflammatory markers, uh, interleukin-1 beta, interleukin-6, the anti-inflammatory interleukin-10. Tim, that's why I was asking you those questions a high sensitivity CRP gamma interferon tumor necrosis factor alpha, and then they tied it with a whole bunch of, of cardiovascular markers, including oxidized LDL and oxidized LDL anti, antibody to oxidized LDL, as well as fibrinogen and uh, homocysteine. So just the way that they thought this through, well, let's check all these things, because in, in, other studies have done one piece at a time but they didn't look at everything. Now, I will say that they have come back now. They've done now three studies, this group, and the last one published looked at actual uh, uh, acute myocardial infarction rates. The second one looked at uh, carotid intimal media thickening, and they all correlated. It's, it's really amazing. But this was the best study I've seen in a group of people showing uh, environmental... Um, exposures here. So you have on the right the taxi drivers in the middle of the non-taxi drivers. So 1-OHP, the marker for the aromatic hydrocarbon, you know, it's almost double in the taxi drivers. It's The average is 60 in the non-drivers. The average is 115 in the taxi drivers. So clearly, uh, you know, they're exposed to greater levels. Uh, LDL was a little higher in the taxi drivers. Triglycerides far higher you know, 102 in the non-taxi drivers, 150 in the taxi drivers. Oxidized LDL, look at that difference. 0.12 in the non-taxi drivers, 0.71 in the taxi drivers. So they're having a lot of oxidative damage. The antibodies to oxidized LDL, 3 versus 32. Homocysteine, 9.8 versus 17. IL-1 beta. Uh, pro-inflammatory, 98 versus 144. IL-6, 119 versus 156. The anti-inflammatory IL-10, 103 versus 61. Tumor necrosis factor alpha, 144 versus 177. A gamma interferon, 180 versus 239. High sensitive CRP, this is a great one, 0.28 versus 1.54. Are you having trouble getting down the CRP in some of your patients? You know, I've really looked at everything I can. What am I doing? They're breathing air. <laughs> um, catalase, 
So Catalyze was 8 in non-taxi drivers. It dropped down to 6.23 in taxi drivers. Glutathione peroxidase, check this one out. 17.28 micromoles in non-taxi drivers. It was less than a third of that in taxi drivers, 6.96. Um, glutathione transferase, 3.41 versus 1.44. And check out, here for all you ascorbic acid fans, 4.54 versus 2.76. So, I mean, clearly, outdoor air pollution causes inflammation, tremendous oxidative damage. We've got the markers right here. This is just from breathing air. Now, this is from taxi drivers, right? But, you know, people, it, there, there are a number of studies now looking at things such as autism. The closer a, a mom lives to a busy roadway, the higher her rates of having an autistic child. The closer you are to uh, a busy road, the higher your rates of asthma and allergy, the higher rates of cardiovascular illness and acute myocardial infarction and hypertension. All these things are really, really well shown. So here's back to what Tim said. Free radical activity is enhancing cancer breast patients while the antioxidant defense mechanisms weaken. I just showed you how just the pollution alone, just from breathing city air, does that. Now, uh, Tim talked about uh, P10, was that right? P10. So, and he showed you the, the hydroxyl radicals, the damage from the hydroxyl radicals. So there is a marker that some of our specialty labs have that's easy to run. It's a urinary test. It's called 8-hydroxydeoxyguanosine or 8-OHDG. What it shows is hydroxyl damage to the DNA. What repairs the DNA? Oh, including actions of functioning genes such as P43, BRCA, and P10. Oh, my. But I thought if you had the P53 gene problem, then you're just going to get cancer, or the Burka, you're just going to get cancer. Again, genetics points the gun, environment pulls the trigger. If you're not having a lot of um, hydroxyl damage to the DNA, doesn't matter if your repair system is not up to snuff. But if you've got high oxidative damage to the DNA and your repair system isn't working, you got problems in River City. Rhymes with, starts with T and rhymes with P and stands for pollution. Okay, so 8-OHDG. Let me show you the stuff that 8-OHDG is associated with as far as cancers. And so I put just the PMID numbers. Breast cancer. It's even thought to be predictive of breast cancer. For some, the more that the articles that they have on these cancers, the more they're finding it's both predictive of it, indicative of increased aggression of it, Relap reoccurrences of the cancer. So this is an amazing marker. Prostate cancer. Now I threw in there that in that study, they put the pa those patients that they put on three weeks of pasta sauce, uh, the pasta sauce, the lycopenes, gave significant and dramatic drop in the 8-OHDG. Cervical cancer, ovarian cancer, lung cancer, nasal pharyngeal cancer. So we're seeing these same cancers that are already known to be associated with cigarette smoking and outdoor air pollution. Uh, acute uh, myodulous leukemia, gastric cancer, bladder cancer. So those are all that we already know are directly associated with 8-OHDG. Predictors of 8-OHDG. They predict cancer occurrence, cancer spread and aggression, cancer improvement, and cancer reoccurrence. So 8-OHDG, it's a simple urinary marker you can do on your patients. Doctor's Data Lab does it, Genova Labs do it. Hopefully other labs will start to pick up on it, but it's an easy thing to do. For those of you who are doing holistic medicine and preventive medicine, I mean, this is just like, you want an easy marker to tell which way the patient's going in their health? 8-OHDG. And if, if your treatment is working, so here's the Genova one. You can see this patient, their 8-OHDG is at 9.1. You don't want it above four. 
If it's above four, you're heading in the wrong direction. So this person at 9.1, I'd be like going, whoa! Now I started doing it because um, doing uh, environmental medicine work, I'm running red blood cell levels through doctor's data on uh, red blood cell glutathione. But it shows in, you know, uh, uh, total glutathione, and I don't know if they got the proper ratio of reduced to oxidized. And as Tim so beautifully showed, if you have increased oxidative stress, it reduces your ability to reduce, therefore recycle, your glutathione. Uh, typically, it does that by affecting the glutathione reductase. So I started running the uh, glutathione, uh, the 8-OHDG on these people to figure out if, you know, if they, if they had a good level of glutathione, was it where it should be as far as oxidized or reduced, so I started running this test, and then I realized, oh, man, the research on this test is phenomenal, you know. So that's how I started running this test. Now, turns out environmental toxicants are also directly linked to elevated 8-OHDG. What a surprise. So here are the ones that are all clearly exposed, uh, you know, associated tobacco smoke, asbestos fibers, diesel exhaust particles. Oh, if I were king of the universe, there would be no diesel vehicles around. <laughs> the worst of the worst air pollutants causing all the damage, so much of the health damage is diesel vehicles. Sorry if any of you are diesel vehicle drivers, but I guess you're glad I'm not king of the universe. Urban air pollution, indoor air pollution, ethyl benzene, benzene, styrene. And interestingly, benzene and styrene uh, are two of the three solvents that's in all the cigarette tobacco smoke. Mercury, arsenic. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't put the uh, the PMID numbers there. Sorry, I missed that one. Um, but then again, I had all of three hours to put this together. So there you go. Uh, so mercury, arsenic, cadmium, lead, organophosphate pesticides. And the organophosphate pesticides are the pesticides in current use today. So if you're familiar with the dirty dozen list from Environmental Working Group, those are the, the foods with the highest uh, pesticide content. Uh, they just, uh, another study was just published looking at, at adults uh, getting off of uh, organic, getting off of commercial foods onto organic foods and their level of these things dropping dramatically. Uh, Genovations does have um, um, a test for uh, the organophosphate pesticides um, metabolites. And uh, like there was one guy I had with chronic neurologic problems and his, he had his level of one of those metabolites was just like nine times the CDC 95th percentile uh, for uh, this organophosphate pesticide, CDC 95th percentile, meaning that only 5% of the United States population had that level or higher. 95% had lower. He had nine times that, or he was 10 times that. <laughs> and where it came out, he was getting it from is he was going every morning to, uh, to Whole Foods and getting, uh, going to their juice bar and getting a green juice drink. Um, you know, you go into Whole Foods, you're going to think, well, I'm getting, I'm healthy. But none of their, their juices at the green juice bar are organic. So I just had them stop it. Two weeks later, we retested it, and magic, 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 all the organophosphates were gone. You know, so you can reduce your exposure to those things pretty doggone quickly. Mycotoxins is a big deal, and you're hearing more and more and more about it uh, all over the place. I think next year at our uh, uh, annual updates and environmental medicine conference, we're going to devote probably at least half of the time to mycotoxins. So I've worked with lots of people with mycotoxins. When I was in the Pacific Northwest, it was common because it's rainy up there, you know? So we got a lot in the old buildings, and I mean, the, the number of people with the, the stachybotrys, the black mold, it was just a phenomenal. Um, I do get, I've gotten a lot of stachybotrys when I was in Phoenix as well. That was mostly due to um, construction defect. 
um, you know, where the, where the people doing the construction project weren't doing good, which could be because um, uh, Arizona is a non-union state and they'll throw up houses pretty quick. You see the site and it's, it looks like an ant swarm. And then like in two weeks, there's a finished house there and you're going, okay. But I have had patience with that. You know, one who, you know, when they, they um, didn't shield the, the metal piping when it went through a two by four, you're supposed to put a metal plate on there. So if you do a drywall screw, it doesn't go through there, boop, right through there in the upper floor, mold all the way down the house. So, you know, when, when you got Stachybotrys present, you got, a, you got a problem. And we had schools up there in the Seattle area that were, were loaded with, with Stachybotrys, which is an immunotoxicant, a neurotoxicant, an endocrine toxicant, and a mitochondrial toxicant. You know, if uh, one of the firehouses up there was loaded with stachybotrys. If the health department finds out, they put a padlock on the door. They don't let anybody live there. It's that bad. Uh, the good news is that when you get away from it, um, uh, most people do pretty well unless they develop antibodies to the stachybotrys. Then they pretty much, what I tell them, if, if you got stachybotrys in your house, and you got antibodies against it, you're gonna to react to all the spores no matter where they are, and spores bind into fiber. So basically I tell them, if you got a house with stachybotrys, you walk out of the house, take your clothes off, drop your clothes on the, on the sidewalk, get in your car and drive away. And just pretend that a hurricane hits your house. Because I've had people that moved three times and brought all their stuff with them and still were sick. So if you know if you got somebody with stacky, um, you can. You, there's now a lab in Texas that does the uh, the mycotoxin uh, urine levels, but you can also do through any reference lab uh, uh, anti stachybotrys antibodies. If they've got that, then it's they've got both the mycotoxin and an immune reaction to it. But mycotoxins are the greatest. Now, this is a toxin, not a toxicant. If it's mold, it's a toxin. If it's from industry, it's a toxicant. Okay, so. Um, but it's the greatest. Uh, people that are in a sick home, sick building, it's typically mold 95 times out of 100. It's not their new carpet, it's the mold. As bad as new carpet is, uh, you really have to pay real attention uh, to the mold. I really think we should be encouraging all of our uh, clients and ourselves and our family and friends, when you're looking to buy a, a house, get it mold tested. You're looking to go into a, 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 get yourself a new office, get it mold tested. They bring people in, set up a little tripod, a little machine on it, either sucks or blows air over a little um, uh, slide microscope slide, and they just go back and, and, and count them. But they do it in two rooms in your house and outside. Because you're going to, everybody's got mold in their house. So those, if you get the mold plates, they'll all be positive. Because everybody's got mold in your house. Because there's mold outside. But if you all of a, if you have stacky, they're not stacky outside. If you got stacky in your house, you got a problem. You need to fix it now. Don't pass go. Don't collect 200. Now. And for most people, it's in there bathroom. You know, the, 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 the shower pan was not properly caulked, and so it get, water gets dripping in behind there, and this waterboard sucks it up. So it's usually bathroom is the biggest area where people get that, okay? So mycotoxins. Um, so that's all uh, oxidative damage and inflammation, all the stuff Tim talked about. You've got the the total interaction of these in common environmental toxicants. We're not talking zebras here. Common environmental toxicants causing these very things. Now let's, let's look at mitochondria. You've heard a lot. You've heard both from uh, Michael uh, today about mitochondrial association with cancer. You heard from Tim about mitochondrial association with cancer. Oh, here's, here's from Tim's slides. Um, many malignant processes involve periods of increased mitochondrial reactive oxygen species production when a few cells survive the more common process of oxidative damage 
um, and then you get this um, mitophagy going on. So here are a few substances that disrupt mitochondrial function. Now here's the ones. The ones in, in blue are in all of us. That's in all of you. That's in all of your patients. Not one, but these are the ones that, according to the NHAN CDC data, are in all of us. Um, mercury, arsenic, cadmium, lead, thallium, organochlorines, organophosphate pesticides, PCBs, dioxin, aromatic hydrocarbons, and particulate matter. I was just talking about that. Toluene, benzene, trans fatty acids, phthalates. Now, you know, the CDC has been doing the... Um, the uh, ongoing national reports. And uh, when the new one comes out, I'll, I've done this for every single report. I go to PubMed, I put in the name of the new compound they found in everybody, and I do and mitochondria. Every single one of these things that's in all of us are mitochondrial toxicants. What's the primary complaint of all your patients? Fatigue. Oh, you're just getting older. You know, I did cleansing. I had a full-on cleansing program in Seattle, full-on. People be there nine hours a day doing uh, saunas, colonics, hydrotherapy. We get people, we re reduce their toxicant load constantly. Doc, I feel 30 years younger. You know, and I, I become convinced. It's not getting older, it's adding more toxicants to our bodies. That's what gives us the aging. I mean, come on, the, you know, we know oxidative damage is underlying all the processes of aging that we don't want. You know, well, guess what all these, these environmental toxicants do? All the ones that we are that are in us ubiquitously from the CDC study, they all increase reactive oxygen species, they all deplete glutathione from inside the mitochondria. When it does that, it depolarizes the inner mitochondrial membrane, and they have trouble uh, with the oxidative phosphorylation. They all do that. So all these environmental uh, toxicants or mitochondrial uh, damaging agents, they all cause, they're all pro-inflammatory, uh, they're all pro-oxidant, and they also rob your body of glutathione. So. One thing we typically see in environmentally burdened patients is uh, immunotoxicity. And it's an interesting imbalance where they can't fight off acute infections, so they get chronic infections. Uh, they also have increased rates of allergy and autoimmunity, uh, and uh, part of that is uh, chemical sensitivity. Um, so that's what we find. Now, we now know why it happens. Uh, those toxicants affect the, uh, the T helper cell zero, and it'll go to Th2, which shuts off uh, the Th1 function. And guess what the mechanism by which these environmental toxicants, how these environmental toxins cause that immune damage? Tim, would you like to venture a guess? It robs the body, it robs the white cells of glutathione. So, <laughs> what are the xenobiotics that deplete glutathione? We're back to the same list, okay? It's the same bloody list. All these toxicants that we all have in us, they're pro-oxidants, they're mitochondrial toxicants, and they reduce glutathione. So did I pull the, did I do the, the dots together good enough for, for Tim and I? I hope so. So now that you see, okay, now I get it. But as Sean Connery so famously said in um, The Untouchables, so what are you prepared to do? So here's what you need to do. Avoidance. Duh. So again, the, the, the uh, fourth national report, this is available right on the CDC website. So um, I was at uh, Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine for a number of years, and 
and I was in a particularly boring all-school meeting. So um, I had my laptop there, and uh, I opened up a Excel spreadsheet on one half, and I opened up the CDC fourth report in the other half, and I went through the CDC report chemical by chemical, and all the ones that were found in everybody, I just, you know, urine level, blood level, and I just, the name and the name of the compound, urine blood level, and I just did an Excel spreadsheet on it, you know? Yes, I'm a geek. I get it. I get it. It's okay. I'm fine with it. If you're fine with it, then we're cool. Okay, so um, uh, 104 of the 212 toxicants they tested for were found ubiquitously. Now, first of all, that number's not very good, right? 104 out of 212, they keep testing more all the time. So right now we're running about 50% of what they test for, they find in everybody, right? Before the, the CDC, none of us knew that there were phthalates, plasticizers in everybody. Surprise! You're more toxic than you thought. So this is a work in progress. Now, 38 out of those 104 were PCBs because they've checked all the PCBs, which are persistent pollutants, right? That's the big stuff from the farm salmon is the PCBs. Um, so I break it down to persistent toxicants, which is the PCBs, polybrobinated diphenyl ethers. They tested for four chlorinated pesticides and eight persistent heavy metals. Those are the persistent ones. So that is, of, of what, of the 104, 63 of them were persistent that they tested for. Uh, 41 were non-persistent. So they just, they, they tested for more of the, the persistent ones. Now they're doing more and more of the non-persistent. So what'd they find? Well, they found um, 30, 63 out of the 104, I got the no, number wrong there, 105, at the number of four were uh, persistent. So by number, it's, it looks higher, but not if you start to add up the total. So that like the total urinary lead uh, or all the heavy metals was 1.4 micrograms per liter. Um, the uh, chlorinated pesticides were in parts per billion, so that's like really, really little, right? Um, couldn't even get up to one microgram. Um, the non-persistence in the urine totaled 413.4 micrograms per liter of urine. 413.4 versus 1.4. So which is the preponderance of toxic burden in the body? If you go by volume, 99% of the urine toxicants are non-persistent. Now, what does that mean? It means that if you take care of your air, your personal care products, your food, and your water, you can cut down your circulating level of toxicants by 90% which means you can cut down your oxidative stress production. That oxidative stress increase, which is caused by these toxicants by over 90%. You can cut down your pro-inflammatory effect by over, from these toxicants by over 90%. You can cut down your mitochondrial suppression, causing lack of ATP and fatigue by over 90%. <laughs> You can cut down your glutathione depletion. That's what that means. Yes, I had a full-on cleansing program up in Seattle. We did, we put people in there three hours a day, a sauna, hydrotherapy, and colonic irrigation, and we saw literal miracles of healing. I had one person that came in said, Doc, I got one foot in the grave and one in a banana peel. He had esophageal cancer. They'd done max radiation, max chemotherapy, and it had metastasized to his liver and his spine. I put him in the cleansing program. We ran him about six weeks, or maybe it was eight weeks. So that's five days a week, about nine hours a day. At the end of that time, the Mets were totally gone, and a seven-site needle biopsy found no primary tumor left in his esophagus. I call that a miracle of healing. You know, and he was funny. He kept coming for colonics. And one time he showed up in a full-on 
softball uniform. And this is a guy you like, he was 63 at the time. He was a uh, oral surgeon, dental surgeon. And um, he said, hey, Walter, he says, I just saw my oncologist. And you know what he said to me? I said, no, what? He says, you look pretty good for a guy with cancer. He doesn't know I don't have it anymore. He was just bounding around. He just, he had a heck of a life going. So I am doing a shameless self-promotion for my book, Clean, Green, and Lean, because it takes people step by step through their home, through their food, through their personal care products. 25 bucks, you can have me in your, for your patients, they have me in their living room saying, don't eat that. Get rid of that. So clean your indoor air. Good pleated air filter and a good air purifier. You can, so an IQ air is a thousand bucks. Give this to a young family, someone that's wanting to have kids. You can alter whether they're, if they live in close to a, a busy road in an urban area with a lot of pollution, their risk of having an autistic child is dramatically high. A thousand bucks, you might be able to prevent a kid having autism. Whoa. There's also, in, in one of the uh, annual updates environmental medicine conference we did a few years ago, looking at infertility and air pollution. So I realized an IQ air in the home could be called a marital aid in the bedroom because it's this pollution that's preventing conception. I mean, the changes can be dramatic just from using pleated air filters in your home. Why? Because all the toxins are on dust particles. So get the dust particles out of your house and then get the, get the air purifier going. Absolutely no mold in the house. It is the most toxic thing in the house or in your place of work. Don't delay. If it's there, you got to take care of it. You got to take care of it now. Everybody's health is being affected. It's just, it's just not worth it, you know? Yeah, okay, you might want to get a new car. Fix the mold first. And if you, if you do have antibodies to it, if you have the IgE antibodies, remember IgE has a very short half-life, so if you got an antibody, IgE antibody to the mold, you can retest two weeks after the mold's been remediated. It should be gone if you did it right. But I got to tell you one thing about mold. People with mold problems typically go from one moldy place to another. I don't know what it is. They'll go for one moldy house. They know it was mold. They know it made a meal. They'll go to another house and it'll be moldy. I had one, one chiropractor that I was working with. Oh, I got seven minutes left. One chiropractor I was working with who uh, he had uh, mold in his house. Horrible neurotoxicity. We fixed that. And he went, you know, they got the, the, they retested for the mold spores. It's done. He's not any better. I retested his IgE. You're still reacting. There's still mold. He found it at his office. Cleared it out of his office. It was behind the sinks in his, you know, little, the little sink cabinets, you know, in, in all the rooms. Cleared that up. Still have the problem. <laughs> Retested him. The antibody was still present. And this guy, part of his neurologic thing was he was like really angry. So this was a real interesting process through this whole thing. And uh, so I'm pulling my hair out. And I don't have that much, right? And a little pull up here. So I'm trying to figure out where it was. Well, he would shower every day at this little gym. Well, guess where, you know, here's the, in the shower stalls. I tell you, people are amazing how well they can do this, especially with mold. So no mold. <clears throat> Get off the, um, the dirty dozen. And I had to throw this in. This is a new study just published, British uh, Journal of Cancer. Uh, this is from the Million Woman Study. Um, in Great Britain, <clears throat> just published, <clears throat> Organic Food Consumption and the Incidence of Cancer. So a measly 623,000 women were followed for 9.3 years. They did a, just the, like the worst survey you could think of. And it was a questionnaire. <clears throat> Do you eat organic food? Never, sometimes, usually, or always. That's how they monitored this. Can you believe it? It's like, oh, well, this is a really good study. But um, what they found was that, um, look at for usual and always the rates of esophageal cancer, but non-Hodgkin's, which non-Hodgkin's in, and that's in all the, the notes that I was originally going to go through, the B-cell malignancies, 
so totally associated with environmental toxicants. And so their conclusion, this study, there was little or no decrease in the incidence of cancer associated with the consumption of organic food, except maybe for the possibility of non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. Well, I'd say a 21% drop in NHL is pretty good. I'd say that anyway. Um, and so then you got the list of high mercury fish you want to avoid and increase the excretion. Now, one of the things is alkalinizing the urine because... Um, you get recycling of all these toxicants that as weak acids if your urine's acidic. And Ron, what happens to people's urine when you do IV vitamin C? It alkalinizes it. It alkalinizes it. Just by alkalinizing the urine, you are increasing the excretion of all the, all the toxicants, including the, the persistent ones. The PCBs, the DDTs, all those. You're increasing the excretion of them. You're increasing the excretion of mercury. You're increasing the excretion of cadmium. If you alkalinize the urine, that's, increased, that's decreasing recycling, increasing excretion. They, that's free cleansing. Well, okay, IV vitamin C doesn't, that isn't free, but it's not what you were expecting it to do, but yet it does that. So um, alkalinization is very, very important. Uh, toxicologists use it as treatment for a variety of, of poisoning. How do you get increased the fat soluble stuff out the bowel? So getting it out of the urine, alkalinizing. Getting it out of the bowel, I already talked about it. Green tea, brassicas, and any, chlor any chlorophyll. It increases the excretion. So how do you take care of all that? You do good avoidance. Um, you increase your excretion and uh, you use the glutathione. <laughs> Plus, I'm giving you a free health tip. So that's me tying it together, environmental toxicity and cancer with Tim. Thank you.